The true magic is not mumbo jumbo and then stuff happens. The true magic is anything could happen because magic works. Magic's real. <laughs> Howdy folks, this is Ivan with Many Realms, and on this episode of Realms Lore, I got to sit down with Ed and talk all about how magic works in the Forgotten Realms, which as you know, is Dungeons & Dragons' all-time most successful campaign setting. We talk all about those with the gift, the ability to manipulate Mistra's weave, and no, I'm not talking about a super fancy hairpiece. What I am talking about is a really, really complicated game of Cat's Cradle that allows you to throw fireballs. But as I'm sure you know, Ed is going to be able to explain that much better than I could, so I'm going to go ahead and pass it on over to him. But before I do, I just want to remind everybody to head on over to patreon.com slash edgreenwood to find extended versions of all of these talks, plus regular Realms Lord drops narrated by the sage himself, Discord benefits, merch, and tons of other really cool stuff. But now, magic. I have uh, created something like 45 or 50 settings or co-created, and um, many of them have had different magic systems. So, yeah, there are different ways to do magic. Um, in the realms, there's... Okay, magic is a shorthand for harnessing the natural forces of the world. Tidal, uh, convection, um, kinetic, like avalanches and landslides, the winds, um, uh, magnetic... Uh, the flowing water, all the f natural forces of volcanism, all of that stuff. Uh, but but magic is a way of harnessing some of that energy and getting predictable or semi-predictable results out of it. As in, it's not just taking it and flinging it as raw power, although Spellfire is practically that. Um, it, it, it's um, having a way of shaping it so that you can predict the fact that what the spell I'm about to cast is going to heal your broken ankle, or the spell I'm about to cast is going to blast that mountain down. Or, um, and I'm fairly confident before I cast this spell that I will be at least trying to do that with the energies I'm going to unleash, not something random as a Wanda Wonder gives us, when meaning I am meddling with forces I really don't understand. So, um, if magic is our shorthand to harness the natural energies of the world, it is of two sorts, purely by mortal labeling. We call it divine magic, or we call it arcane magic. It's the same thing. But one of us, uh, one of the things we can get directly, and the other one we, we call on the gods to give us, or their servitors, but it's the same thing. You, you you pray to the god, and the god gives you that power. So, and in the realms, and here's where it gets different from most settings, the, we call the, the most popular uh, shorthand method of accessing these energies, and it's the most popular because it's the fastest and works best with a heavy payoff, we call that the weave. Not, not right, the things again, you put in your hair. No, no, no. And, and what it means is that there's lines of force running everywhere, all intertwined. And part of using them is to figure out how to grab hold of them. And so they came up with the cool name, The Weave. And actually, I think Julia Martin in real life stuck that word on it. Okay. Um, but for me, the most powerful deity in the realms is Mistra, the goddess of magic, because she is the weave. The weave is Mistra, and Mistra is the weave. And um, you can exist after death as a voice in the weave, meaning not just a voice, but a sentience. Um, if Mistra chooses to, or if you die in the right manner, your brain and thoughts and memories, the, your soul, if you will, but that which is you is not lost, but is in the weave, preserved. So, um, dead magisters, um, the, the chosen of the past who have fallen are in the weave. Salune, for instance. And in some cases, they can pop out of the weave and possess 
a new mortal body take it over ethical considerations aside because of course one of the things i've been dealing with in the realms is what are the ethics of you know you have all this power how do you use it when you're affecting people around you mortals around you creatures around you of all sorts that don't have that power number one and number two um the effects of absolute power or near absolute power and corrupting you over the years and in the case of all of the chosen driving you insane because you've suffered so much loss you've uh, you outlive people so you you outlive all the nearest and all your loved ones from your childhood you usually outlive the countries you grew up in you've lost everything what does that do to your sanity um so those are two of the themes I've been exploring for yeah, over 50 years wow. now uh, yeah. <laughs> in real time. Uh, uh, but, but yeah, um, Mr. Is the Weave. Now, um, other designers than myself added the Shadow Weave to the realms, and that was Char exploiting the spaces in between the weave. But the, sh the, the Shadow Weave can't exist on its own. Because it's a shadow of the weave. It exists in the spaces between. Without the weave, the shadow weave will collapse. Because it, it is leaning on the weave for structure support and leaching energy from the weave. Because the weave is the shorthand way of getting to the energies. There are other systems of magic in the realms. I keep mentioning them, like table magic and so on. True name magic and so on. But... They get mentioned and then never, ever developed because that's another headache sure. for designers. Interesting. So you're, <laughs> and it's another... So you're telling me that there are alternate magic systems that have existed within the setting that never kind of took hold or never got launched into official publications? Yeah, they got mentioned over and over again. And you know, occasionally, uh, Weld Magic, for instance, had its own book, you know, old its own art resource book. Um as people sort of dabbled in them and then said, nah, let's just have more character classes and use the what we've already got. <laughs> yeah, I think that's something <laughs> anybody who has ever played Dungeons and Dragons can relate to, is that sentiment right there. Um, yeah. One thing that I really loved about um, how you kind of portrayed magic in the Forgotten Realms was really evident in the Elminster series, was that Mistra wasn't conceptual right mistra like could be spoken with she could be communicated with she was she was something that was like i don't want to say fully tangible but was something that wasn't just a concept out in the ether and i think that goes back to what you were just saying about kind of like the roman and the greek gods how they were they were fallible and that they were they kind of just super people um and that always made it feel very rooted to me and very grounded because just giving it that kind of identity offers it credence and like legitimacy and really like strengthens that immersion for me personally. And I think other people would agree. Yeah. And the other thing about, uh, because, um, TSR storytellers seem to want to kill Mistra every Yeah. What the minutes. hell's with that? Um, <laughs> it's like every yeah. two seconds. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, it, but it actually created a great opportunity for me because Okay, first of all, how can you kill Mister when she's more powerful than everybody? Oh, okay, so obviously her power has to be limited. She has to vest it in various mortals, the Chosen and others, who are either witting or unwitting weave anchors. They're, they're all over the world, so it's all the powers invested in her. And the other thing is, once she's given this power to a mortal, she can't wrest it away from them. Yeah. I mean, she can by destroying, right, sure. but that means she loses the power until it finds its way very slowly back to her through the weave. She is lessened, diminished, and she daren't do that because once it, it's the old thing of um, once other powerful uh, entities like deities realize that her chosen could be killed, well, they're going to start killing them all over the place. So she's got to avoid that. Um, so... What you end up with is a is a Mistra who is a, a rookie, a mortal replacement, who is actually depending on her older chosen, like Elminster and Kelvin and the Seven, for advice. You know, so, and therefore, that puts the agency back in the hands of mortals. Yeah. And it emphasizes to readers and to players, your characters matter. It's not the gods telling you what to do. 
It's the gods trying to achieve things, but they can only achieve things through mortals because their own power depends in large part upon how many mortals worship them. So mortals are important, but mortals are just as fallible, in fact, more so than the gods, and mortals are just as ignorant of what's going on and the consequences of what they're doing as they do it or before they do it as the gods. Um, so there's lots of room for adventure. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that to me. And the other thing that, that people, uh, this is a misconception that some people have even today, that Mistra is a goody two shoes and sure. she's there to save the world. Mistra is neutral. She's there to increase the use of magic. So she doesn't want rulers or deities or priests to hoard magic and lord it over others. She wants everybody to get to use magic. If she can get little hopping frogs and, and sticky insects to use magic, she'll be deliriously happy. So as a result, her chosen go around the world, leaving spell scrolls and spell books and magic items where people can find them, which is why you go into a dungeon or a tomb that somebody should have looted centuries ago, and there's something there for your player characters to find, because... Five minutes ago, some chosen mistress said, oh, the adventurers are heading this way, so I'll leave the scrolls right here for them to find. That, yeah, that was a, a, one of my favorite concepts for this place, Blue Alley. Yes. Yeah, I created the, you Blue, did create Alley. the Blue Alley. It was a okay. mini dungeon. Yeah. The, the mad wizard would leave, would steal things just to see if adventurers could get through the Blue Alley, and he would leave them at the end. Yeah. And that was... <laughs> yep. I, I thought yep. that was so fascinating to me. That was always one of my favorite little adventure hooks in all of Waterdeep was the Blue Alley, just because it was so mysterious, and it was exactly what you're just saying. Yeah. Well, I had great fun in the Blue Alley. Uh, I had, I had uh, undead who were reduced to skeletal form wearing sure. ball gowns and, and you know, <laughs> dancing with each other. And, and, and I had, you know, all sorts of fun stuff in the Blue Alley, which was a sort of gauntlet or gantlet, depending on, you know, <laughs> yeah. um. <laughs> Uh, your literary term uh, the, for for you to run and yes and and others have developed it uh, for uh, DM's Guild and so on and done a really good job by the way um, but yeah that was a mini dungeon that I ran because I run I ran lots of mini dungeons in the realms because um, it was more realistic and you could get through them in a short play or so it was more real realistic for small compass things to exist in the realms like one guy's tomb shouldn't cover yeah. acres and be 50 sure. rubles deep um, because somebody had to dig that too, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and probably not the only guy who died. So, you know, you got to get this one finished before the next guy dies, you know? Um, so, so there were lots of little mini dungeons and they also fit um, neatly into a three or four hour play slot at an early Gen Con, which was, you know, one of the few conventions that, that I could go to. And that was a, one of the few opportunities for people to play together with other D and D players they didn't normally play with. Are there certain classes that I, I guess manipulate the weave differently? And and the one of the first things that comes to my mind is, is kind of like sorcerers versus wizards versus warlocks and these natural predispositions for using magics and 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 how that looks kind of behind the scenes and some of like the narrative linchpins that hold that all together. Sure. Okay. So. Uh... The, the magic is known as the art um, in, in the realm. Um, and by that, they really mean all magic, but most people in daily mean arcane magic because they think everything else is prayer, okay? And, and the uh, natural ability to wield magic at all is known as the gift. And some people have well talents, as in it, uh, they don't have to necessarily be taught. They can manifest particularly in moments of uh, heightened emotion like grief or anger like somebody's just wiped out your family in front of your eyes and you're a little kid and with tears streaming down your face you say I hate you I wish you were dead Laugh. and then when you do that out of your fingertips or out of your eyes shoots magic and you fry some, some um, unsuspecting raider and then all the rest of the raiders kill you because, oh my goodness, you know, <laughs> uh, or you kill them all because you just go nuts, you know, um, and then everybody around you says, oh, he has the wow. gift, kill him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's, I'm, I'm following a theme but here. If, 
Yeah, yeah. But if they if you flee into the woods before they can do that, then you're the you could become a sorcerer because you learn. Then all I have to worry about is Mister turning yeah, you into yeah. a woman <laughs> against your will. Ah, uh, well, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. Uh, but 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 no, a sorcerer is somebody who's learned some control over their natural gift, their well talent. Um, now there are others. Uh, um, one that got read de-emphasized in the game and then changed. Um, my original spell singers um, were uh, people who could dance in a ring, sing and dance in a ring, and unleash that way magic far more powerful than any of them could do by their own. And the nice thing about that in the early storytelling way was if you grabbed one of these spell singers, if you were the evil duke or the king, and you grab this person, they literally can't help you on their own. So the thing about spell singers is, um, let us say for the purposes of argument that the spell singers are a bunch of beautiful women dancing around a fire late at night because they need a focal point. And it could be anything. It could be a tomb. It could be, um, you know, a, a stump in the in the. Or it could be a weird shaped stone, and. But let's say they, they are all dancing around this focal point late at night and say that they've done this several times in the past. So some people have spied on them and know they do this. So they hear the singing in the, in the woods late at night and they tell the, the, the king or the baron, now's a good time to grab them. So the king and baron's men sneak through the woods and they run out and pounce on one of them. All the others flee shrieking and they grab one and they put her in chains. Okay, she can't help them. Mm -hmm. She can't even dance now that she's sure. in chains. You know, and if they're scared of what she's been doing, they might have put a gag on her or just shoved their hand over her mouth. But she can't sing. And then they say, do magic. She can't do magic. So therefore, she's useless to them unless they can get all the others. But even if they get all the others, how are they going to force them? Well, they can threaten them. You know, dance and sing in a circle or will kill your, your loved one here. Well, yeah, what's the stop of dancing and singing in a circle to unleash magic that kills all the guards and, and saves their loved one? And so that storytelling reason gave us spell singers, which also gave us the idea that, hey, you could wield powerful magic and not be the stereotypical crotchety old wizard who'd had to learn stuff for for years and all oh, without being the wicked witch who has to shove Hansel and Gretel in the oven and cook them because hey evil witch you know there are other ways of accessing magic that didn't play into those stereotypes which again meant that you couldn't trust anybody you met in the realms which meant again it was more realistic and it was forcing you to role play or if you were reading fiction it was opening up possibilities on all sides because you couldn't go Guy with beard like Ed here, wearing long robes, <laughs> equals powerful wizard. Yeah. You know, you couldn't automatically assume that. Oh, powerful wizard, put an arrow through him before he does something dangerous. You know, instead, you put an arrow through the old guy with the wizard, and the little girl who's been trundling along behind the wizard carrying his water puts the water down and blasts you to kingdom come. Because just like in that that movie they did, I think it was, it was called Sleuth or Clue, where um, Sherlock Holmes, played by Michael Caine, was an idiot, and Doctor Watson, played by Ben Kingsley, was solving all the. Oh, wait, you could you could pull that one all the time, um, because you're not only shaking up their stereotypes, you're giving them a way more interesting story. They're all of a sudden they're paying it to. Oh my goodness, anything could happen, which is what you want at the gaming table, and also what you want when you're writing a story, you want occasional payoffs where the reader is saying, yes, 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 kill the bad guy, save the princess, blah, blah, blah. But I mean, until then, you, you don't want it to be totally predictable. You want things to change. So you want to, you know, anything could happen. That's what you want. And that's what I'm here for. Let's make anything happen. That's what this game does. That's what, you know, fiction does. Let's have anything happen. So that's what we do. And that's the true magic. The true magic is not mumbo-jumbo and then stuff happens. The true magic is 
anything could happen because magic works. Magic's real. So anything could happen. Just be careful you're not standing there at ground zero when it does happen. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good moral. That's a good way to cap it off there. That's fantastic. Hey, it looks like you made it to the end of the video. Awesome. Thank you so much for sticking with us. If you liked what Ed had to say, be sure to hit the like button. Uh, if you want to see more videos like this, go ahead and subscribe. And then definitely hit the bell icon if you want to know when more videos like this are coming out, because it's going to start happening a lot more frequently. Uh, don't forget to go to patreon.com slash edgreenwood to see extended versions of all of these talks, plus like a ton more. Um, and also, I just want to say a huge thank you to all of our patrons that make this possible, especially the Legends of the Realms, Francisco Cabral, South Hill Sages, Stephen Snow, Martin Berlanda, John Foster, Gerald Brady, Hunter Weber, Michael Scattergood, Jeremy E. Grenemeyer, Robert McDonnell, Fire Wraith, Melody Sigers, Gustavo Tortato, Puffles, Brian Kloitzel, and RPG Match. Also, a big thank you to the sponsor of this series, RPG Match, which is a really cool new tool that tabletop role-playing gamers can use to find their perfect table anywhere in the world, as well as many realms. Oh, in fact, I attended a, 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 a Bowie concert years ago. <laughs> there were guys in the audience who, who were in, in full armor with swords, and he's yelling. <laughs> That's a great story. All right, you made it to the end of the video. Dum doop dum 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 dum